I think we're missing some of your furniture up here. I present unto you, Tom Solzer. Testing, testing, testing. I think I think I'm on. Sounds like. Well, good morning, everybody. Wow, there's life in the. Okay. Well, the heck with that. <laughs> Hello, everybody in Zoom land. <laughs> well. The Coeys are in Michigan? They go to Michigan. As long as they don't come back wearing blue and maize. They're all right that way. Isn't that right, Wayne? That's it. <laughs> well, we'll just stick this thing in here for lack of a better place to put it. <laughs> okay. I have... <clears throat> I'm going to take you to a scripture first that's been kind of a a place, well, the Lord's been rearranging me. Let me just put it that way. But one of the things that he profoundly, and I brought this up um, in meeting and fellowship before, that, that he really kind of highlighted, which has been really a liberating thing to me, and it ought to be because it's the word of God. But it's, in, it's found in Philippians chapter 2. And I'll begin in verse 5. It says, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men. Well, what, that, what that has opened to me is Jesus is this, is literally the word. He's God in the flesh. So he, is, he occupies this highest spot that, that deserves all of our attention, all of our worship, everything, all of our focus and everything that, that he is. The other thing that's illustrated here in this passage, these passages in Philippians, is the fact that he makes himself, even though he is the king and deserves his, his righteous place as head to sit upon the throne and for everybody to bow uh, at his feet, he makes himself the lowest possible thing that he can in order to totally identify with you and me. Because if we came to a place where, where we in our everyday lives realize that we have messed up again, or not even come to the Lord at the beginning, he has made himself lower than us, or at least equal to the, to the worst of our conditions in a total place of humility so that we can go straight towards him and not, not go to him in an elevated place. We go to him in this place of true humility where he's humbled himself and become as low as I am so that I can have access to him so he can meet me where I am and then elevate me to where he wants to take me in him. 
Well, all that being said, <clears throat> it's, it's affected the way that, that I believe that ministry is, that, that my ministry, any time that I minister, I have an understanding that the, that the thing that my ministry starts with is a place of real humility where I have no reputation and no thing. So this morning I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about the, uh, the objective of the Father. The objective of the Father is to make sons. It's to make sons and daughters. It's to make family. And family is what everything's all about. But the Father is so committed to this that, that uh, he's just been speaking this to me in different ways. It's not that he just teaches my life is, oper is, is he's orchestrating my steps to experience and confront things in me where I say I'm not worthy to be a son. I'm not worthy to be your child. Because he's at war with that in me. Every place where I disagree with his word the way that he says that it is, if I hold it in a false place, in a place where I think that I'm humble, or I, I think that I, I have no worth and no value, and it goes against the word of God, the way that he says that he sees me, he is at war with that wrong attitude that I have. Why? Because it's a lie. So I tell you that, to tell you in, in connection with Philippians that I, just, that I just read to you, and I tell you that I come to you as in no elevated position, I come to you again in, with, with just kind of, just pulling back the covers, so to speak, and letting you be aware of the fact that there's a whole lot of things that the Lord is working on in me. I have no elevated position that I come to you in. All right, I want to take you to some scriptures. I want to take you first of all to John, first chapter, John 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are the children of God by faith in Christ. No, Romans no. eight twenty nine. He also predestined to be conformed to this to the image of his son, that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. I could go on and on and on, but But the highlight is, is the, the father, when he set things up in the beginning, when, he, when we read in Genesis 2, where the, the, the Lord makes Adam in his own image, he, it's the, it is the image of his son, his sons, his daughters, his children. That is what he is making. And he... And wherever there is anything off, the father is absolutely consumed with a desire to establish his son, his sons, his sons and daughters in that place where he is ordained originally. He's always fighting for that. So, what is, so if we ask the question, what is God doing? God is always bringing us into a place where, we, where, where he is forming you and me as his, as, as his son in the pattern of his, of his son Jesus that, that, he brought to, that he brought in heaven. Father, I'm just going to slow down right here and I'm going to ask for... I'm just going to ask for your empowerment, Lord, for, with your word. I ask you, Father, for places in me that would, that,
I ask for the fullness of your spirit to move here today through me, Lord. I ask that you be glorified. I ask for ears that would hear, hearts that would receive the things that you're saying. Father, I ask that the things that I speak about me and my life personally would be understood as parables for what you're actually doing in other people's lives here in this congregation and in, in it, that, that hear my voice. For Father, I, I pray that it's not my voice and my story that's being told, but your voice and your story that's being told. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> I'm a part of a glow, which I'm blessed to be a part of a glow, women's a glow. It's actually, uh, and Elena is part of a glow, and all, a lot of you here have been, Pastor David and Ruth are part of a glow. You've been uh, advisor in the past and what have you. But women's a glow is amazing. Amazing. It's a group of women that follow the spirit of the Lord. And I won't go into all of that, but they had a conference, a spring conference this past March. And it was amazing. I mean, I, I've been to a lot of conferences before, but this, this conference was just off the charts. Well, you know, with any conference or any kind of, when you hear people speak, there's, things can be good, but the Lord will always have, if we're paying attention to listening for the voice of the Lord for what he has, there's always gold there. There's always a nugget that touches us in ways that, that are just unique and, and they, they're just for us. Well. There was a woman there, and I'm not gonna tell this story very well, but it's not important. The, the, there was a woman there that literally the Lord used to touch me in a way that, that I haven't been touched in a long time. She had, she had cancer that was gonna take her life. Correct me if I'm wrong in any of these, please. She had cancer that was gonna take her life and she, she got with the Lord and the Lord basically said to her, do you believe my word? Well, the Lord was insistent enough and gave her enough revelation that she evaluated. Now she has, she has a husband and children and what have you. The, this mother and this wife is going to be taken literally within a period of months. This cancer that she had was very aggressive and they even knew when it was gonna be the end of her life. And they set a date. They literally gave her a date. By this date, you will die. So it was pretty final and pretty grim. <clears throat> In getting with the Lord, the Lord said to her, believe my word. Do you believe my word? Well, she took that to heart and didn't just listen to the Lord and take the Lord's words in that she heard in her spirit. She started to pick those things apart. Why are you asking me if I know your word? I know the Bible. I know it backwards and forwards but why are you saying this? And it, as she dug into the Lord and what he was really meaning to say, it became totally vivid to her that what the Lord was saying is, do you believe my word or do you stand in a place where you have a mixture of what you have in your life that you accept as truth and put it with my word? And do you operate out of a mixture of two words that are not necessarily compatible or do you believe my word? 
Well, it hit her like a ton of bricks. And as I'm listening to her, the Lord is impacting me because he's asking me the same question. Do you really believe my word? Well, the thing that she understood that what she was to, she was to get totally committed to the word and everything else that was not the word she was a, she was to get rid of in her life he was calling her to a specific place of separation unto him and the separation was to his word and the challenge was of her belief she started to see on the inside of her in an evaluation of what the Lord was saying to her. She saw that there were things that were, that were, not, that were not pure. She literally shut down her television, shut down all of her media, took pictures and things that, of, that, that, were, that conformed to the culture out of her house and then put all over every wall with her children and her husband they put scripture up on walls and you can't walk through that house without seeing the word of god on the walls all over the place and not only was she getting that she was repeating it she put words of healing promises where the Lord had said because because she, she put the promises of God in his word on her walls to get it into her heart that was contaminated with not just with not just the good word of the Lord, but contaminated with other things that were in there that she would brought out of the culture when she got saved. She got radical. Didn't she? Nothing changed in her life. Her cancer got worse, but she dug down deeper. It didn't make any difference how hard the enemy and what the enemy basically was saying and all of the onslaught from doctors and, 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 and family and friends. And they were an isolated pocket, a family that was, that was literally there, committed to the word of God to grab on to what the word said and the promises of God that he said and make them so aware in their heart and have and grow the expectation that there was no negative no other thought allowed into the way that they were thinking the whole family did this the day came that the pronouncement of her death was there. Her health, she has the charts, literally had declined. She told doctors, I am praying, I am going to be healed. The day that she was to die, she was totally healed of cancer. <clears throat> Now I have two knees that are bone on bone. That's why I'm sitting down and instead of standing up. So this is, this is in March that this conference was and this woman got a word from the Lord that she was to pray for me and pray for my knees. And another woman, Jane Coons, had at the same time, they came from different places in this conference during a prayer time and they came from different parts of the room both of them had a word from the Lord that he was healing my knees they started to pray another woman 
came and joined and said, I'm here because the Lord is saying that he's doing healing here. She didn't know me from Adam. My knees are not healed. But the Lord from that point started to change and confront things in me that I have had in me for years that he's at war with. And he means to bring me into a conformity of his word. And I'm starting to get radical in believing him. So this is late, this is March the 18th, 19th, and 20th that this conference is. I am uh, enrolled in in, uh, in, a, in college online, and at the and and the college basically ends um, in the month of April. Well, by so my knees have not been affected to a to. They've not been healed totally, but I actually am in the process. My knees are actually getting better through different things. I won't go into that. That's not the point. The Lord wants to take, to take and, and create a path here. At the end of April, by the end of April, I physically started to feel absolutely horrendous. I had, um, I had by the time that it was the last week of college. I had a constant temperature of 105 degrees for a full week. That abated. I had a doctor's appointment set for the 11th of April. I went in for, a, for blood work prior to that, uh, or on the 11th, I'm sorry, of, of April, of May. And they called me back and said, we think that, there, that there's something either wrong with the blood work or, but we need to have you go back in and have blood work done again. There's confirmation of things that we, we just need to go. So I went the next day, the Friday, and that was Friday the 13th, which means nothing. <laughs> means nothing. And the blood work came back and my doctor called me. She said, you need to go to the hospital immediately. You're in kidney failure. Well, well the Lord in, in, in pushing into his word and pushing into a relationship through every day, getting up early and praying and spending this is this I'm just telling you what it is. It's been my pleasure to sit with the Lord for an hour, two hours, three hours, four hours, being retired. I have a luxury to be able to do that, pushing into him, into his, into the relationship with him, to know him more. It's been my heart cry. This emphasis that the Lord wants to, wants to bring me into a place where I believe his word more than I believe the things that I have thought about me and my identity, who I am. The Lord is shifting a thing in me and then the enemy starts to see that there's progress being made and sends this thing to me to take me out. But the Lord has a, a, a plan in this whole thing too. Now I'm gonna tell you. So I've told Pastor David you know, some of this story. So I, I'm in the hospital and I go, as I'm going into the hospital, I drove in, with, with the net, we go into the emergency room and literally everything, as I'm walking in the hospital, in the, into the, the emergency room, everything starts to close in in my vision and everything starts to go gray and I start to get tunnel vision. Why? Well, I, I knew it was death. I knew it was death. I go into the hospital and, and get into the room and what have you. I'm, 
they treat me with this, that, and the other thing, and I'm laying on one of those really comfortable gurneys that there are in there. So, you know, with a thin little air mattress that squeezes down to this, and you have a bar in your back running this way, and one in the, you know, on your shoulders is really great. I was on that thing for like, I don't know. Anyway, so they start to treat me, and the Lord speaks to me as I'm alone there in the room, uh, in, in the emergency room, and the Lord says to me, I'm going to give you a choice. If you want, I'll take you home. And there was no guilt or condemnation in his voice at all. The reason that, or, or he said, okay, I have to tell you this too. So you, you all don't know me and you don't know the situation. There's part of the things that, that I struggled with have been uh, and the Lord had me confess it before the congregation, I have struggled with a spirit of suicide all the time that Annette and I have been married for 50 years. I've, had a, I've struggled with a spirit of suicide all of that time. Anyway, I confess that there was, a, there was things that were broken off in, in congregation with their, but the Lord, there was, the Lord was asking me if I wanted to go home. And he was actually putting the nail in the coffin with the enemy if I, with that whole suicide thing to, to just kind of finalize that thing. I said to the Lord, Lord, taking me home is actually not a bad thing. But what do you want? What do you want? And the Lord said to me, you know what I want. I said, I said, then I choose what you want. I knew instantly what he was talking about. I said, I choose a life of faith in you. And the Lord said, okay. Now, I'm, so, you know, you, you have something like that that goes on internally in your thoughts, and you think, okay, is that really God? Is that re did that really happen? Is that, did I really have a conversation like that? So, the, so I have a friend who lives in North Carolina who hears from the Lord pretty well. I, during the hospital stay, he called, I was in the hospital for two weeks and then in rehab a week after this. So obviously I didn't die. I, I went, I went on. <laughs> this is clarification. That's exactly right. So he calls, he says, how you doing? He says, but before you tell me, he says, I, I want to tell you what the Lord told me. I said, okay, Matthew, what, what do you, what do you want to tell me? He says, the Lord said that he gave you a choice whether you wanted to, whether you were going to live or die and you chose life now why would matthew tell me that and why would the lord give matthew that information because it was confirmation that what i heard in the hospital was absolute reliably hearing from the father matthew in north carolina heard that during that same period of time it's amazing well, I'm in the hospital and the Lord says to me, and this is how it kind of ties back to, uh, ties back to this woman from the Aglow conference. He says to me, all right, Tom, live by faith in me by my word. I want you to fight with my word against this death. So I started fighting with his word and the, the thing, it was just real. So I'm just going to kind of tell you that in that place where, where he was with me, he started to give me favor with people in the hospital. I, there was like openings to speak about the Lord with doctors and nurses and, and this person and that person. It was like, it was like, I don't know. It was just favor. There, there was a nurse there that, that was in my hospital room that, 
that made a statement that I, that I really felt filled up then with the Lord. And I gave her the word of the Lord and it hit her upside the head and you could see her literally kind of, kind of shaken and transformed by what, by what I was telling her. It literally, according to her, it changed the way that she thought about her destiny and her life there in the hospital. She brings back the next day or the, whenever it was, I don't, I don't even remember, but, but she brings in like this herd of nurses into, into the room to, to, to introduce them to me saying, this is the guy who told me things that, that, that nobody ever knew. And it was just, it was just kind of that, that way. The Lord started to put, put things together and, and really kind of illustrate that what he was after was he was after things that filled my heart that were, that were things that were, that I believed rather than the word of God. He let me know that he was, he was, it was just, I just can't hardly explain this. I felt him like a loving father saying to me, Tom, I'm growing you up right now. And I want you to grow up with me here. I've, let, I've given you grace in these things where I've allowed you to, to have them. But the day is now, you're old enough and mature enough that I'm going after the places that that you, have, that you have not actively participated in yielding to what I have said about you. I'm correcting your image and putting your image as the image of my true son. You are not acting like my true son. The image that you have of yourself that you brought out is from another father. I never gave you those things, and I want you to know that I am at war and causing you to be a warrior after those things. I'm going to start to show you what's in your heart. And boy, has he. So the Lord is making me literally. So in the hospital and in rehab and even since, I'll flip on a YouTube thing on World War II or the beachhead at D-Day or things that are war-related things, and I'm like sucked into this vortex of, of, in my spirit, I feel like I'm involved now in, in a warfare that I am not afraid of the bullets that are flying around me. I am participating with the Lord of the battle, to go after things that have, that have been occupying my land, the land of promise of the kingdom of God. And I am participating with him to stand and fight against the lies that I've believed. And as I see those things, I, dip, I come into places of Man, I'm telling you. My nature coming, my nature is typically, it's, it's not an extrovert. I am really an introvert, very, very much so. I also have developed a, a, a in order to survive without the Lord, I've had strategies because of one thing and another, of hiding from other people, of, of becoming passive, of becoming yielding to other people. All of that, I feel right now, is being exposed in me for me to see those things as they are, and a spirit of the living God that is a spirit of the warrior for me to stand against those things now and say, I am not that at all. That's the old me. 
that's died. I will not stand in that place and take a, and take a stand in, that joins with his spirit and war against the lies that I've had in me for years. Does this make sense? So again, I'm not telling you anything that elevates me. I'm telling you and talking to you about the, the, the way that the Lord is leading me now, but it is a thing that we're all, uh, we're all involved in. The work of the Father. I took the seed of his son, the unperishable seed of his son into me when I was saved and born again. The Father means fully to have that seed bear fruit. The, the pattern seed of his son is what I am predestined to be conformed into. We all are. And the Father will not have it any other way. You know, the Father doesn't compromise. He allows, he, he says in his word, I think to Joshua, you know, you're gonna go into the land, you're gonna conquer the wild beasts of the land little by little because that's the way it's gonna be. It, we don't understand that that is actually us with our internal life. Places where we've made agreements with the culture and the, and the king of, and the kingdoms of this world and the prince of this world, we've made agreements, all of us, so that we can survive in the world and not get eaten up that have been against the word of God. And the Lord will come and weed those things. Right now, I'm telling you, it's a place where, where the Lord is weeding me, his garden. I think he's doing it not just in me. I, I see it and I hear it throughout the body of Christ. That for people who can listen and hear and participate and come into a place of yieldedness to him and yieldedness to what his word says about me. See, we are made sons in order to fulfill the mandate that God set for his children on earth, and that is to bring the kingdom of God onto the earth, on earth as it is in heaven. You and I become sons and, and daughters of the living God to be able to, to, to understand and know the Father so that we can bring the kingdom now, sonship and the knowledge of him is meant to bring the kingdom. You and I have been chosen to enter into the Father's business. There's a whole lot that I could say, but I, I've, I'm going to keep this short and simple. Well, maybe not short, an hour and a half or so. <laughs> the Lord has, I, I'm a really slow learner, a really slow learner, but that's okay because he's a really persistent father. He doesn't give up. <laughs> the thing that is, the thing that, that he, let me give you this picture. Jesus stands next to the Pharisees. And the Pharisees want to give him a little of the kingdom that they live in. They want to give him a little bit of hell. 
So they test Jesus and they push at him verbally. Their, their justification for what they're doing with Jesus is this book. They know the book backwards and forwards. Yet Jesus looks at him and says, your father is not my father. Your father's a different father. Jesus, who is the word and knows the word backwards and forwards, is connected in a different way. What, what are the, both of them know the word, yet what's the difference? Well, the difference is that one that is relational. The difference is in, so you, we can, I can know the word. I can know, and, I, and I, I've known the word for a long time. But the Lord is moving me more and more and more into this relational place of one-on-one -on -one spending time with him, knowing the things that I read here and then discovering the reality of them through knowing the Father. Does this make sense? In Matthew 22, I think it starts in verse 35, 37, don't quote me, but, but we'll get there. But basically, um, he's saying in 35, there's a, a, a man, a lawyer, who wants to know what, how do you sum things up? What's, what's the, what do you do? Jesus says, okay, it's love the Lord your, your, with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. That is everything. All the laws, all the prophets are hinged upon those two things. That's basically, the, it's one coin and it's two sides of the same coin. When we go into a place where we learn the word, but don't have a living, full understanding of who the Father is, then we have not entered into eternal life. We just are good scholars. So when the Lord is pushing me into a place where he says, know my word and believe my word. He is, he is attacking places where I have, where my belief of who the father is, are the things that need to change. Because the Pharisees look at Jesus and they believe the father is a harsh one who has a bunch of rules and a bunch of laws. Jesus, who knows the father, says, no, all of these things are absolute, they don't go away, they're there. We operate out of them, but they operate out of a place where I know and you need to know the father. It is a so the Lord is affecting my belief, not just my knowledge of the word. Does that make sense? So when he's going to the core, he's going to the place of really what I truly believe. The woman who had cancer, the emphasis and the point with him, with her, was, you know my word, what do you really believe about me? I hope this makes sense. This is exactly where the Lord is, is leading me. Now, I, I've had a problem with, with Father, okay? So the Lord's had to plow up things with me, and I'm finding out that the, the things that I've read in scripture that I kind of know but, but don't really know is he really loves me. He really is a God of, of love. That's what it's all about. Everything else will blow away and we'll have faith, hope, and love that, that remain. All of the other stuff doesn't mean two hoots in a windstorm. I said to somebody last year in, in the class, Tom, what, do you have a problem with love? 
I said, in receiving love? I said, yeah, I can describe the way that I am. I, if, if love is rain, I am like, I have galoshes on, I have a raincoat on, I have an umbrella on, I have a tarp over me. I have, so it can, I can be standing in a place where, where love is all around me and I am determined not to get wet. So the Lord says, basically, so to put this in a little bit different perspective, the Lord says, I'm meant to give you love and you're meant to take it and receive it. I'm at war and I'm really mad that you can't receive my love and I'm going to go after it. You don't know how to do it, Tom. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk this thing through with you. I'm realizing just my eyes are being opened. I'm realizing that he's so good. See, I have this thing. I've also got, and, and through my, I was raised Catholic. That gave me a real healthy religious spirit. Really healthy. And the Lord is, is killing that religious spirit. That's one of the things that he's, that he's gone after. So I have this merit mentality. Did you catch that? That, that is a wrong foundation to my relationship with me and the Father. And he's going after that. Again, I have to tell you, you know, I'm talking about myself, but this is not about me. It's him being faithful to know what, what is in my heart and bring me out of it so that I can fully participate in the fullness of every promise in his word and end up looking like his son. Listen, this is not my work. I don't know how to do this. He is doing this. How does he do this? Know the word? Yeah, it's that, but it's also having a relationship with him, knowing what he's doing and, and, and seeing what he's doing and stepping into that and walking with him. It's fighting when he's fighting and not fighting against him to protect old patterns and old identities allowing him to tear the things down. I wake up the other morning, this is a couple of weeks ago. I wake up the other morning. Has anybody ever had a vision? Has anybody had visions? Yep. I wake up and I, I sit up in bed and I see, I, I have this vision and I see what I know is Jesus coming a long way off, walking towards me. And I'm, I'm looking as I'm sitting up in bed and I'm looking at this. And as he gets closer, I see that it's actually me. What was the Lord saying? He is changing me into his image. I am becoming the image of Christ. It just blows me away. I'm in, in saying yes to the Lord with, okay, Lord, uh, I choose life. I choose to walk by faith. There's this, I'd like to have, I'd like to have the knowledge of what's going on and how to do things all worked out for me so that when I go, when, I, when I'm uncomfortable in ministry situations or have to talk to somebody or, or do different things that, are, that I'm uncomfortable with, I'd like to have all of the answers and all of the things worked out so that I know what the heck is going to happen. That's not faith. So the Lord the other day shows me he says, this is, you're, looking for, you're looking for all of the answers. You're praying to me and you're, you're wanting to know how to do this, how to do that. I'm not going to give that to you. What I'm going to give you and what I've already given you is I've given you my word. But it goes in this box that I want you to carry. I said, okay. 
He says, take a look at the box. It looks like this, this average looking wooden box about this with a hinge on it, a wooden lid with a hinge. And he says, open the box. I open the box, I look inside the box. Do you know what's in the box? Nothing, <laughs> not one thing. The Lord says, what's in there? I said, nothing. He says, that's the way you feel when I send you out and you know that you're supposed to go minister. That's the way you feel when you have, when, when you are doing things with, your, with yourself and you don't know how to do it. You feel uncomfortable and there's nothing. He says, I want you to go with a box with nothing in it, with the full expectation that when you get to the place where you're supposed to do what I want you to do, you open the box and I will have filled it for that minute. I said, okay, I can do that. I'll do that. And that's been working. Scary. But faith, you spell faith. How do you spell faith? R-I-S-K. And that's kind of the way that it is. So the Lord says to me this morning, you know, again, I want to have everything figured out. The Lord said, and so I'm praying, Lord, you know, even like, this, give me the right words to, 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 to say. For, I have up at four o'clock in the morning worrying, okay, about what I'm going to say today and how I'm going to present it. Four o'clock. So I'm tired, and it didn't mean a thing. The Lord says to me, in me begging him, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I minister before people and get your word and, and, and the emphasis on you, not on me? How do I do that? And the Lord says to me, you got a box. There ain't nothing in there. But let me tell you something else, Tom. You don't have to get what you've already got. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Everything that he says that I've gotten in Jesus, I don't have to beg him for, I've already got it. I have to step out in faith and believe it. Put up Galatians 4.19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Oh, it's absolutely this thing where, where I am being formed into his image. I'm winding this thing down. Uh, I could, listen, I've got all kinds of proof scriptures for what I'm, uh, I'll give you. No, I won't. So the father is the father is bringing all bringing me and bringing all of us into the place where we fully know him we operate into a place we're growing into a place of maturity that's in philippians we are we're growing up into him who's the head we are growing into him and that's what he's developing he, we end up looking like Jesus and Jesus ends up looking like the Father. We were predestined to, to, to look like the Father. We were made in the image of God. We are made as kings and priests. The character of a king and priest has to be 
good. The character that he's developing in all of us is the character of his pattern son, Jesus. Why? Because he wants to give us and put us into his business. What is his business? Jesus came and preached that the kingdom of God is here. To bring the kingdom, we do not know how to bring the kingdom and hear the Father to be able to bring the kingdom until we are fully operating sons and daughters of God. I hope this is positive to you. I hope it's encouraging to you. It is to me. It's, <clears throat> it doesn't mean the things that, that we have a charismatic Pentecostal poof, the magic thing happens and one day I'm sick and now I'm no longer sick. That typically does not happen. The way that the Spirit of God operates is he will move and change things so that you know if you're connected with the Father, you know what he's doing, you can see it, you're participating in it, but nobody around you sees anything changing. You have a question? Absolutely. We, we do, we, we, that's, a, that's excellent. So it's a, the reason we want to know what's going on in our lives ahead of time is because we have a fear of the unknown. Are you with me? But what happens, how do we handle fear? Perfect love casts out fear. So that's why it's important to be able to receive the love of the Father through relationship that's good and healthy. That's what gives us a foundation. And understand. And in that place where we receive and know the love of the Father and we're able to operate in that, we can step out in a place where we say, I know your character and I know your word. Your word and your character always lines up. I don't have to know what's going on. Fear doesn't rule me here. I know you in this situation and I'll go forward. The enemy, the enemy works for the father. The enemy is not a God. I'll talk about that another time. Okay. <laughs> he is not, there's only one God. He is not, he's not, there's not a big God and a little God. There is God only and, and everything that the enemy has to do has actually been on assignment from the father so that he, the, that he uses the enemy and the trouble that he, that he causes to bring us back to the father. I could preach about that at all. Well, maybe on another day. God always rules. There is no, there's no place if we, to, quickly, to quickly answer your question. The enemy had to have permission from the Lord to do what he did to Job. All right. Listen, the, don't be afraid when the Lord's working on you. So even when the enemy is in, so, so in, to, to maybe highlight this a little bit differently, to answer and, and give you a little bit more insight, Julia, and everybody, the, the Lord did not put sickness on me when I had the kidney failure. That was absolutely the enemy. But the Lord knew where I was. I have, I have a set of eyes that, 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 the, that if I see with the eyes that the 
I can see with eyes that look at the trouble. Or I can see eyes that in the middle of the trouble, I see what the Lord is doing. And I can see the promises. If I, in the midst of that, so the enemy has an intention to take me out. The Lord has an intention in the middle of the trouble to bring me through and establish me more in him. I have the responsibility to ask to see what the Father's doing and not bite into the negative with what the enemy's doing. So it can be the same trouble, but the Lord can take it and use it for good. I just want to bless you. I just want to bless you. I've been, I'm, the Lord is blessing me. This is, there are things that are changing in me that are exciting. I feel full of peace and joy and hope and faith in ways that I, that I have had in the past. And they're being established even more. There used to be times where, where it could be described as the wild toad ride. There'd be highlights of, of places where, where I felt supremely confident in the Lord and then the bottom would drop out and, and I'd wonder what the heck was going on. The scripture says that what his work is in you and me is he'll take every mountain and level those things out and fill in the valley with that residue that's in and make straight the way of the Lord. There's a place where the Lord is bringing all of us in the place of sonship where no matter what the heck happens, the road is level in him. There are no highs and lows. It's a constant place of being in him and walking with him. Father, I thank you for, for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you've given it to me. Lord, I, I, I just ask that, that you just, with each individual, there's gold nuggets, things that, that are important to each person individually. Father, I, I just bless those things that are important to each individual. You work in different ways with different, your, your God. I bless your seed. Water your seed. Let it be received in the heart with, with openness and belief. Let there be a connection that's stronger to you. Father, I bless your word. I bless what you're doing. Let it bear fruit, Lord. Amen. Thank you all. Do you can pray for a little meal for the food. Oh, sure. I, sure. I, I hope I set the set the oven right, or we might not have my wife's good lasagna. Oh, but, but, but it's be lasagna crisp. Set. Pardon? <laughs> Will it be lasagna crisp? Hopefully, I set it right so it's not a burnt, okay. uh, burnt offering. All right. Well, you, well. First of all, everybody here is is absolutely. Welcomed to lunch. You don't have whether you brought anything, whether you didn't bring anything. It's irregardless. We want to, we want to fellowship with you. So, Father, we just ask your blessing on this meal and your blessing upon fellowship. In Jesus' name, Amen.